dawn at the Temple of Heaven in Beijing, China rises. When these people were children, the communist leader Mao Zedong gave a warning. A single spark can light a prairie fire, he said. There will soon be a high tide of revolution. It is like a ship far out at sea, whose masthead can already be seen from the shore. It is like the morning sun in the east, whose shimmering rays are already visible from a high mountain top. It is like a child about to be born, moving restlessly in its mother's womb. 4,000 years of continuous civilization, yet the Middle Kingdom was weak, poor, and divided between ancient and modern, wisdom and power, east and west. Shanghai, the Roaring Twenties, the most vibrant of Eastern cities, its exotic appeal captured for a Western audience by a European camera team. A place described by one of its own newspapers thus, Shanghai is a non-productive city. It is a parasitic city, a criminal city, a refugee city. It is the paradise of adventurers. The Shanghai Derby, 1925. A horse called Warrenfield won. The ponies were Mongolian, the punters Chinese. The owners were Western businessmen and colonial officials. The jockeys were always British. They'd been racing in Shanghai since 1844, the year the first Western businessmen took residence. The East India Company agent visited in 1832 and reported, the advantages which foreigners would derive from the liberty of trade with this place are incalculable. Foreign trade was imposed on Shanghai by force. When the city fell to the English fleet in 1842, the Qing emperors said farewell to centuries of self-imposed isolation. Shanghai became what it remains the greatest metropolis on the Asian mainland, a monument to colonialism. Many Chinese prospered. They made a good living from the trade with the West. To this day, half of China's total exports pass through Shanghai. But the penetration of foreign money and barbarian habits dealt a festering blow to China's self-respect. This is the Shanghai Cotton Mill No. 2. In 1925, its Japanese owners sacked some Chinese workers. Their comrades went on strike. In the violence which followed, a Japanese foreman drew a gun and shot dead a young trade unionist, Gu Junghun. Lots of students came to our factory and told us about his heroic deeds. Most of the workers in our factory in those days were young people. We went off with the students to Nanjing Road, to the front of the Yung An department store. At the time, there were a lot of students delivering speeches at the main door of the shop. The roads were filled with a sea of people. The buses and trams came to a standstill. At a quarter past 12, we heard a gun go off. It was a signal. The red flags were fluttering and people started throwing multicolored leaflets full of slogans. Then we lined up with the students, eight in a row in front of the Yung An shop. We walked towards the police station. The police came out and wanted to stop the demonstration. They said, if you want to demonstrate, go to the Chinese district. This is a foreign concession. 
The student said, this is Chinese land. Who says we can't demonstrate here? The British police inspector ordered his men to open fire. 11 Shanghai people died. The date was May the 30th, 1925. Twenty-eight cities held protest demonstrations. The marchers felt the foreign presence in their country as a national humiliation. They demanded change in the spirit of their former leader, the Christian doctor Sun Yat-sen. At the time of his death early that same year, Sun had been China's revolutionary figurehead for 20 years. He was the founder of the National People's Party, Guomindang, KMT for short, and of the party's military academy at Wampoa. The academy, established in Guangzhou, is today to be found in Taipei on the island of Taiwan. The party legacy of Sun Yat-sen is kept alive only here. Since the triumph of communism on mainland China in 1949, the island of Taiwan has kept the faith. The annual military parade, an embattled last redoubt, armed to the teeth against its communist enemies. But old soldiers here remember a time when nationalists and communists still worked together. When for the young men at the Wampoa Military Academy, the hopes and dreams of changing China were realized. General Liu Anqi remembers how he got there. Mama. My mother secretly gave me 40 silver dollars. I took the $40 and ran away to Shanghai. At secondary school, I had a teacher who was an old KMT Nationalist Party member. On the road, he told me not to go to Shanghai University, but to try for One Power Academy. Immediately after our graduation ceremony, I was one of 20 men selected for promotion to company commander. They made me a commander because I was so tall and dark. I stood out and looked very soldierly. I've been through hundreds of battles and escaped death thousands of times. The academy was funded by the Russians. Its first commandant, Chiang Kai-shek, a young nationalist who'd been trained in Moscow with ambitions to make China great. Because China was ungovernable. The warlord Wu Peifu ruled Beijing. In the far north, another warlord, Zhang Zolin, who ruled Manchuria. The so-called Christian warlord, Feng Yuxiang, he was rumored to baptize his men en masse using a fire hose. Warlord China was a mess of chaotic armies with no central authority. The KMT officers hatched a daring scheme. Their plan? to strike north from Guangzhou towards the Yangtze River and Shanghai to reunify China by force. In July 1926, Chiang Kai-shek formally dispatched his KMT troops on their northern expedition against the warlords. They marched under the flag of the nationalist Guomindang, though many of them were communist sympathizers. The Russian view? The communists should do coolie service for the Guomindang. United against the common enemy, 
soldiers and brothers, Liu Anqi and Liu Anyu. Down with the warlords, down with the foreign powers, chase out the warlords. Love your country, love the people, don't think about money, don't fear death. Those were the slogans we used to chant. The slogans kept us going. The success of the northern expedition depended not only on our courage, but also on the trend of the times and the ideology of the day. The whole country sang a song about the goal of the northern expedition. It was a very simple song and everyone knew how to sing it. <laughs> At the time of the Northern Expedition, we wanted to topple all the imperialists, including you British people. Because you British had a lot of privileges in China, you had your own settlement in Shanghai, you even put up a sign in a Shanghai park saying, no dogs or Chinese. So of course we were against you. Shanghai, the yellow Babylon. The paradise of adventurers represented to Chinese patriots everything that was wrong with their country the architecture, the flags of the hated imperialist powers, the barbed wire, a part of China that was forever England. One never asked why someone had come to Shanghai, said Lady Jellicoe. It was assumed everybody had something to hide. The Shanghai of the 1920s was a mecca for adventurous Westerners with an eye to the main chance. In the get-rich-quick culture of the day, young men went east. They made money, they had fun, they worked in import-export. They lived in the international settlement. The international settlement was an area of the city where the Chinese government had no jurisdiction. It was not exclusive to Western immigrants. By the end of the 19th century, it had half a million Chinese residents. Still, it was the principle of foreign control which angered Chinese patriots. Long-nosed foreign devils harnessing Chinese servants for rickshaw polo. The troops of the Nationalist Northern Expedition approached the River Yangtze. They were welcomed as liberators in the city of Wuhan. They promised an end to the capricious cruelty of the warlord era under the banner of Sun Yat-sen's Three Principles of the People. Nationalism, democracy, and socialism. It was all highly worrying to the foreign business interests in China, especially when riots broke out at the city of Hankou, up the Yangtze River from Shanghai. Crowds burst through barricades into the foreign concessions. The northern expedition marched straight on through the riots. Its commander, Chiang Kai-shek, pledged to protect all the foreigners in the city. 
Shanghai prepared to receive the Western women and children evacuated downriver from Hankou to temporary safety. They believed Shanghai would be secure. Military reinforcements were hurriedly drafted in. Sikh soldiers of the British Army were among 22,000 foreign troops in Shanghai for that crucial spring of 1927. They closed the gates of the international settlement against hundreds of Chinese people trying to escape the coming storm. As the settlement was sandbagged, the Chinese city beyond was in a fever of anticipation. Local communists were organizing the welcome for the northern expedition. On March the 21st, the labor union launched a general strike and armed insurrection against the local warlord. We got out some celebration firecrackers that we'd bought. Big ones and small ones. And local people helped us to get them ready. The small ones went off like machine guns. The big ones were really noisy. The enemy didn't know they weren't real guns. What they heard was the rattle of machine guns resounding all around them and the big crackers going off with a big bang. We shouted, charge! The National Liberation Army had grown on the way as warlord troops changed sides. Its victory in Shanghai was the high point of this first stage of the military drive to unify China. But the political coalition was cracking. Chiang Kai-shek had no time for the communists or for the left wing of his own KMT nationalists. Even his supporters find it hard to justify what happened next. On the northern expedition, the troops of the warlords that we recruited and their officials, their thought diluted our revolutionary thought. Do you know what I mean? We ourselves were contaminated by their bureaucratic thinking. It was a military success, our northern expedition, but our politics had gone on a southern expedition. At that time, I got caught. I was locked up in a back room at their headquarters. At three o'clock, they started to hit me, hit me, hit me. They hit my legs to make me confess I was a communist. I said, I don't know what's a communist. Who are you then? I'm a worker. I just want liberation. So they locked me up again. Mr. Sun was one of the very few Shanghai communists who survived the White Terror. Revolution is a bitter thing, said the author, Lu Sun. Mixed with filth and blood, not so lovely or perfect as the poets think. Thousands of suspected communists were executed in a few weeks. In Shanghai, there was never any shortage of men who would murder for money. Chiang Kai-shek's massacre of the communists was carried out by the infamous secret society, the Green Gang. From their origins as a guild protecting the river boatmen, the gang had evolved into a sinister mafia. Chiang's friendship with them brought him into alliance with organized crime, controlling the docks, the river, and the opium trade. Their leader, Du Yueshung, drug baron. His prize was the job of chief of the new Bureau of Opium Suppression. For form's sake, some opium was burned. The North China Daily News published a guide, how to spot communists at moving picture shows and other public gatherings. 
Chiang Kai-shek celebrated with a wedding. He married well. His bride, a wealthy, Western-educated Christian, Sung Mei Ling. Shanghai went back to what it knew best, the glamour and the dancing. A feverish round of parties for the rich Chinese families who had done well out of contact with the West. But behind the dazzle, for the rich, life in Shanghai would never be the same. Chang launched a reign of terror against them. In my arms, dear, away from harm, dear, we'll let the rest of the world go by. Desperate to raise money to finance his army, he coerced vast sums from wealthy Chinese industrialists and bankers. Fifty million dollars came from ransoms on their children, kidnapped by his green gang friends. In Shanghai in those days, nothing was as it seemed. The communists had been driven from the city, yet their future secret police chief, Kang Shung, was undercover in disguise as a rickshaw boy. The left was down, but not out. It was during the White Terror. The League of Left-Wing Writers did a lot of dangerous work. They had to keep on the moon, usually about once a month. So I was able to give them a lot of help. I could help with moving their printing presses. It was very difficult then to get things printed and do our propaganda work, so we had to print our leaflets ourselves. Because I was young, no one would take much notice of me if I loaded things onto a rickshaw cart and took them away. So that's how I started on the road to revolution. It was poor, really poor. The minute you went out, you'd be surrounded by beggars. They were selling their sons and daughters. As a schoolgirl, seeing this kind of society, after all, I was Chinese. No Chinese person wants their society to be like that. What is the greatest force? asked the communist Mao Zedong. The greatest force is the union of the popular masses. What should we fear? We should not fear heaven. We should not fear ghosts. We should not fear the dead. Shanghai remained fertile ground for the revolutionaries. The chance of work, even on the docks run by the Green Gang, was drawing more and more people to the city. We all came from the countryside. We had no choice. We couldn't stay at home. We'd rented our land from the landlord. We had to pay him back in grain every year. It didn't matter if we had a harvest or not. We had to give him something. There was no way out. So we came to Shanghai. I'm from north of here, and I came to Shanghai. I worked on the docks, but it was very hard work. And then I didn't know anyone. It was a good job I could do the heavy physical work. The contractors came one by one to look you over. If they thought you looked strong enough, they'd take you on. Every time we had to line up and wait to be called up. That's the way it was in the past. You never knew if you'd get work the next day. You might get work today, but you didn't know about tomorrow. That's the way it was in the old days. If you got work on my dock, you weren't allowed to work on another dock as well. If you wanted to work on another dock, you had to give them money, otherwise they wouldn't give you a job. How much did you pay them? You had to give them at least two bags of rice. They wanted rice because rice was like money then. The Yangtze River boats had no engines in those days. They had to be hauled along by men. We sang as we hauled. 
Why did we have to sing songs? It was because you needed four people to carry things, not just two, one at each corner. That's what we'd sing. We had to sing in unison. You couldn't do it without singing. If we didn't sing, we couldn't keep pace. Mr. Pan and Mr. Chung still sing together. Now they're part of the Shanghai Coal Handling Dock Workers Union Choir. They commemorate the end of the bad old days, of capitalism, imperialism, and of Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang and his nationalist KMT defeated the warlords. But their northern expedition could not save the Middle Kingdom from weakness, poverty, or the foreign devils. For Shanghai, the question remained the same one raised by a reformer of the 1850s. The most unparalleled anger which has ever existed since the creation of heaven and earth is exciting all who are conscious in their minds and have spirit in their blood. Their hats are raised by their hair standing on end. This is because the largest country on the globe today is yet controlled by small nations of barbarians. Why are they small and yet strong? Why are we large and yet weak? On the top floor and roof of that house of multiple joys, a jumble of tightrope walkers slithered back and forth, and there were seesaws, Chinese checkers, mahjong, strings of firecrackers going off, lottery tickets and marriage brokers. Joseph von Sternberg, the film director, described this place in the 1930s. The Great World Amusement Center stands today, and though it's no longer quite so glittering as the director observed, Ding Jing Tang still comes here. The Great World is a very interesting place. I used to come here very often when I was still a schoolboy. That started in 1931, when I was only 11 years old. There's a saying, if you haven't been to the great world, you haven't really been to Shanghai. The great world is very well known to everyone all over China. It's very famous. People who come to the great world are all very ordinary people. In the old days, there was one aspect of the great world which was not so good. Hooligans and prostitutes wandered all round here, and that was not good. Von Sternberg saw girls whose dresses were slit to the armpits, peep shows, rubber goods, and two love letter booths with scribes who guaranteed results. Outside, the street for saying goodbye to girls, prostitute lane. There were 700 brothels in the international settlement alone. Thousands of girls drawn to the great city of Shanghai, its filthy slums no hindrance to their desperate need for money. To this day, Shanghai, Paris of the East, is a byword for glamour in China. The writer Aldous Huxley described it as life itself. Nothing more intensely living can be imagined. Dense, rank, richly clotted life. Shanghai was in the throes of an industrial revolution. Inside the silk factories. The chief factory inspector was a socialist from New Zealand. He said, the children, many not more than eight or nine years old, stood for 12 hours over boiling vats of cocoons with swollen red fingers inflamed eyes. The writer Christopher Isherwood paid a visit. He wrote, if you tire of inspecting one kind of misery, there are plenty of others. 
A vast army of women and children brought him from the villages under contract to the gangs. I came from a poor peasant family. I had a bitter life. One day, some people came to our village to recruit workers, and that's how I got to Shanghai. My mother didn't want me to come. She thought that if I came to Shanghai being a young girl, I'd never go back home. But I said she shouldn't worry, because there'd be lots of people traveling together, and I'd be with them. So we all came together, and we got to this factory. It was all young girls here. On Sundays, we knitted and mended our socks. We never went out. The presence of mill girls like Su Lai Di was a great temptation to reformers. Left-wing parties were banned, but the cause thrived under the surprising banner of the Young Women's Christian Association. In Shanghai for many years, Christian missionaries and teachers like Cora Dung had been in the forefront of reform. We didn't mention the word revolution, because as you can imagine, the students would have been arrested, our school closed down, and we'd all have been imprisoned. So it was a tactic not to mention it. In the classroom, we had to teach using proper methods and textbooks. We did everything properly. And the girls worked very hard at their reading and writing. At the same time, the YWCA had a very good method of doing things. We organized an industrial girls club. We had called it the Working Girls Club, then changed it later to Workers' Friends Club, but that didn't do either, because the authorities were suspicious. If we used the word workers, it meant we were rebels. Cora Dung survived because so many leading Chinese nationalists were also Christians. But domestic disagreements were soon overshadowed. Though politically Shanghai was ruled by the nationalists, the economy increasingly belonged to Japan. The Japanese did not like Chinese nationalism. They were afraid of losing their market. This was not a theoretical danger. Many Shanghai people did boycott Japanese goods and campaigned hard against anyone suspected of doing business with the people they dismissed as dwarf barbarians. The Japanese consul sent the mayor of Shanghai an ultimatum. The game came to an abrupt end on the night of the 28th of January, 1932. Reuters reported, the Chinese city appeared to be one big bonfire with flames leaping a hundred feet into the air amid a roar audible at a great distance. The international settlement became a haven for anyone trying to escape the Japanese bombardment. Real pictures of the hostilities which began in 1932 attracted worldwide acclaim for the courage of Shanghai's Chinese defenders, but this was only the beginning. War with Japan would soon consume China. North China was already under attack. In the forbidden city in Beijing, frenzied plans were underway. The former imperial palace was now a museum housing the priceless artifacts of the Sons of Heaven. The wealth of the dynasties on public display. As war loomed, the custodians of the treasures prepared to evacuate, a responsibility borne by Na Che Liang. 
We had no problems with transport. It was just the people in Beijing. They were against it. They said, what's most important? The people, the country, or the treasures? You don't care about the people. You don't care about the country. All you're bothered about is taking the treasures away. But the treasures were of no use to the war effort. And if they were destroyed, they'd never be replaced. Finally, we decided it was better to get them away. One national treasure was now Japan's secret weapon against China. The boy emperor, Pu Yi, the child who came to the throne at the age of two, the last son of heaven of the Manchu dynasty. It was in 1934, 20 years after his abdication, that Japan put Pu Yi back on the throne. Not emperor of all China, but of the huge northern province of Manchuria, ancestral home of his Manchu dynasty. His sacred dragon robes brought north from Beijing for the occasion. Pu Yi dreamt of the return of the old China. Japan dreamt of domination over the whole continent of Asia. The new emperor of Manchuria was a puppet. Later, he said, Thus it was that both trembling with fear and dreaming of my future restoration, I shamelessly became a leading traitor and the cover for a regime which turned a large part of my country into a colony. Pu Yi's ancestors had invaded China three centuries earlier across the Great Wall. They say it's the only human construction visible from space. But the Great Wall of China was always a miserable failure. Built over many centuries to protect the heart of the empire from barbarian invasion, it was repeatedly overrun. China was never safe. A humiliating truce with Japan forced the Chinese army to withdraw south of the Great Wall. The area was still occupied by the great Manchurian warlord, Zhang Zolin. He was assassinated by the Japanese. His son, Zhang Suiliang, took over. The boy dictator is now in his 90s. After my father died, I took over. The troops weren't a big burden. I already had 90% control of them. But I'd never had to consider politics before. After my father died, the politics all descended on me. In those days, the young marshal was dismissed as a feckless playboy, too keen on the opium to be much use as a leader. But the warlord became a hero to a generation of Chinese patriots. In this newsreel, he quotes Sun Yat-sen as he finally brings the warlord troops of the north into line with Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists. At last, China might be one country again. Generalissimo Chang and I, I always addressed him as Generalissimo, we had a disagreement about this. But Generalissimo thought the communists were the main enemy, so we ought to wipe them out first. I felt the Japanese were the main enemy. We didn't agree. I did think the communists were enemies, but they weren't the biggest enemy. The biggest enemy were the Japanese. I mean, at least the communists were Chinese. They weren't going to destroy their own country. A great many people agreed with the young marshal. 
On December 9, 1935, thousands of students demonstrated in Beijing against Japanese power. Chiang Kai-shek had complained that China was chaotic, dark, and spiritless. He wanted young people to express a spirit of loving their country and loyalty to their race, but only if they agreed with him. The December 9thers were locked out of the city, clubbed, and arrested. On the anniversary of their suppression, one year later, protests flared up again all over the country. The young Marshal Zhang was in the city of Xi'an, where Qin Chuan heard him speak. After the hunger strike, Zhang Sui Liang invited us to the headquarters where he was staying. He spoke emotionally, tears were streaming down his face. He said, the nation's in crisis and my family has been wronged. I will not let you down. I vow to recapture our land. Chiang Kai-shek arrived not long after. The city was already on alert. We were in charge of defending it. After a while, our colleagues came back, saying they'd arrested Chiang Kai-shek. They'd taken his false teeth and a gold-plated belt. Later, we took the belt to use as theatrical props. We didn't know it was worth a lot of money. We just took it to play with. We were prepared to arrest Chang and kill him. We put up posters with the words, Public Trial of Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek survived because Stalin instructed the communists to negotiate his freedom. When Chiang and his wife flew back to their capital of Nanjing on Boxing Day, 1936, 400,000 people turned out to welcome them. The young marshal had tried to force the Generalissimo at gunpoint to accept a united front against Japan, to free political prisoners, to carry out the will of Sun Yat-sen to save the nation. Chang gave only a verbal agreement to review the situation. The Xi'an incident was a heroic failure. The kidnapping made world headlines. Chiang Kai-shek is released and restored to his American-bred wife. The head of the Chinese government was kidnapped by Chang, the young marshal. But it all ended happily in an exchange of oriental courtesies. I have never had any regrets about anything I've ever done. If I want to do something, I'll do it, with no regrets. What's done is done. I alone am responsible for my actions, no one else. That's why, after the Xi'an incident, I went to Nanjing. There, they could have had me executed or shot, given me a death sentence. I take complete responsibility for everything I do. Complete responsibility. Zhang Sueliang gave himself up to face court-martial for insubordination. Shanghai enjoyed six more months of the old life, until in the summer of 1937, the shots were fired which marked the beginning of the Second World War. Two years before Britain, four years before Russia and America, the Great World Amusement Center went to war. The shooting began in Shanghai on the rainy night of Friday the 12th of August. It was warm and humid. Next morning, four Chinese pilots took to the air to attack Japanese positions in the city. People gathered to watch and cheer. Inside the great world, the fun was suspended. The building had been turned into a refugee camp. It sheltered thousands of women and children. When the Chinese bombers missed their target, the great world took a direct hit. Thousands were killed. The Chinese bombs hit the center of the international settlement. It was a bloodbath. For the Westerners, August 1937 
was a profound shock. The North China Daily News announced that the presence of the British wives was a positive menace to the lives of their menfolk. They were evacuated. If we allow one more inch of our territory to be lost, Chiang Kai-shek had said, we shall be guilty of an unpardonable crime against our race. The war was still undeclared. Chiang called for an all-out stand. The Japanese were unstoppable. Thirty years later, a visiting Japanese dignitary expressed regret to the communist leader, Mao Zedong. Mao replied, there is no need to apologize. If the Japanese had not occupied half of China, it would have been impossible for the entire Chinese population to rise and fight the Japanese invader. And then Mao smiled and said, should I thank you? You have seen in the pictures and you have read of the destruction of homes and the terrible slaughters being carried out by the Japanese throughout our country, wherever their bombers could fly. Chiang Kai-shek, his wife and his supporters, now faced a war which was to last 12 years and end in bitter failure. The flags of the nationalist Kuomintang fly now only in the island of Taiwan, occupied by Chiang Kai-shek in his last defeat. The nationalists have turned their capital, Taipei, into the noisy and bustling center of one of Asia's fastest growing capitalist economies. But even this success is a bitter reminder of what might have been. Taiwan is a last resting place. Chang's statue looks down on the tourists who come to his National Palace Museum. They come to see the treasures which belong to the forbidden city in Beijing. The priceless hoard of the emperors of China brought to Taiwan at the end of an epic journey of escape. Our luck was very good. We packed them all onto trucks and set off without knowing where we were going to take them. It was 16 years before we found a permanent home for them. We'd searched everywhere, tried every place. We had some dangerous moments, bombing for example. Every time we moved, bombs would drop behind us. Of course, we worked fast. We didn't lose a single crate through bombing. We didn't lose a single crate through lorries overturning. We all say it wasn't us. It was the treasures. The treasures have a spirit of their own. The spiritual heritage of China, rescued against all the odds, first from the Japanese and then from the communists shipped to Taiwan by the self-appointed guardians of the national soul. Millions of nationalists fled the mainland after the communist victory in 1949. Mr. Na was just one of them. He guards the burial place of Chiang Kai-shek's ideal. Thoroughly to militarize the life of the people of the entire nation, to make them nourish courage and alertness, a capacity to endure hardship, to make them willing to sacrifice for the nation at all times.